I'm gonna show you every basic modeling tool in Blender. And this is the shit you get on the side of the screen when you go to edit mode and you press T. And if you know how to use these tools, that's basically like 25% of everything you need to know about modeling in Blender. Now I'm making a new ebook where I'm gonna put everything that I know about modeling, not just the tools here, but the modifiers, the 3D cursor, all this crazy shit about topology, basically everything that I've gathered over the past 10 years that I've been using Blender. So if you wanna pre-order that, then check it out, it's in the description. The extrude tool allows you to select some geometry and extend it or push it in a new direction to create new geometry. So if you go to face select mode, you select a face. Now if you select your extrude tool over here, you're gonna get this weird control right here, but we're just gonna use a shortcut because it's easier. So you can press E to extrude this face, and as you can see, the face moves in the direction in which it is facing, and we get new geometry between between the new position of the face and the old position of the face. You can hold shift to slow this down, or you can hold control to snap it by the grid. You can also extrude individual vertices or individual edges, and this doesn't have any fixed direction. This can just move freely. So when you perform the extrusion, you're going to get a little menu down here in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you open this menu, you're gonna get some more tools which you can use to tweak the extrusion. So for example, you can flip the normals and that's gonna invert the normals on this new extruded part. I don't know why you would wanna use it, but sometimes it might be useful. You can also dissolve the orthogonal edges and this is going to remove the edge that you had here before. Next, you have your inset faces tool. When you select a face and you press I to inset, the face is going to be pushed inwards and you're gonna get some new faces around this face. This is essentially the same thing as extruding a face, right clicking to snap it back into place and then scaling it down. But this is only true if it's one single face. You can also select multiple faces and inset them together the insetting is gonna be the same, but the edge which connects the two faces is not going to be inset. Now again, when you inset something, you're going to get some more controls down here. If we have a cylinder and we delete one of the faces, and then we take some faces on the sides, which are right next to the deleted face or the hole, and if we inset those, we can uncheck boundary, and the edges which are next to the hole are not going to be inset. If you inset multiple faces, those faces are going to be inset individually rather than together. This is the same as insetting one face, then insetting the other face, then insetting the other face. And it's also essentially the same thing as going to face, extrude individual faces, right clicking, setting your pivot point to individual origins, and then scaling things down. This is basically the same thing as insetting individual. Now, when you inset a face, you can also check outset. Then instead of pushing the face inwards towards the center of the face which you are insetting, you're going to create a new edge below the face that you just tried to inset. Here's another example of how that might work. It's essentially the same as adding a loop cut right here below the selection. Now, sometimes when you want to inset some faces on an organic surface like this one, you're going to get some ugly kind of twisting on the edges that you're trying to inset. If you check edge rail, these edges are going to be a lot smoother and they're going to move directly along the line which is extended between the first vertex and the last vertex of a particular edge along which you're insetting something. You can also toggle even offset to control whether or not everything is gonna have an equal edge along the sides. And of course, the depth is going to allow you to push this whole selection inwards or to push it outwards. This depth control is the same as insetting a face and holding control while you're insetting. This is gonna move the selection inwards or outwards, which is also basically the same as pressing Alt-S, which we're gonna get to in a second. Now, the bevel tool is one of my personal favorites. If you select an edge and you press Control b a bevel is going to be created on that edge. If you want to compare this to something in real life, this is basically like you take an edge and you sand it to make it a little bit smoother. Now, by default, you're probably just going to get one face to replace this edge. Edge. But if you press Control b and you scroll up or down, you can control the number of edges that you're going to have on that bevel to make it smooth and round. And as you move your mouse, the bevel is going to get wider or narrower. Then once you perform the bevel, again, you're going to get your little menu down here as for everything else. And here you can again control the width. You can control the number of segments, which is the same as scrolling. And you have a bunch of other cool controls. For example, you can control the shape. If you slide this back and forth, look what happens to the bevel. This is a very useful tool because sometimes you want to add some extra edges around these, but you don't want to change the shape of the object. So if you bevel something and you just turn it into three edges instead of one, you can set the shape to one, and this is the same as just adding some new geometry around this edge without actually changing the shape of the object. If you have only two segments in the bevel, you can also set the shape to zero, and this is the same as creating a little cutout around this part. So if we select the whole object and we bevel it, everything is going to be beveled and the corners are gonna have a sort of grid fill between them. You can change this by going down here to intersection type and instead of grid fill, you can select cutoff. And now instead of a grid, you're just gonna have a hole right there. 
Another cool thing that you can do is you can select some vertices and when you bevel them with control B, you can press V to only bevel the vertices. And this can be used, for example, to create a sort of die shape like this. If you bevel something and you change the width type to percent, you can now choose the percentage of the length of the edge along which you're beveling. So for example, if we set this to 50%, we're going to get halfway over this edge and halfway over this edge. Since this edge is a lot longer than this edge, the bevel is going to have a different shape. You also have some more controls for the type of width that you want to have. So you can go ahead and explore that a little bit more. For example, you can also create a very specific type for the shape of your bevel if you just go down here from super lips to custom. So I recommend you play around with this a little bit. You're going to find out a lot of new shit. The loop cut is also one of the most important tools for modeling. This is one of the first things you're going to have to learn, but I'm going to show you some more features about it. If you press control R, you can select an edge and you create a continuous loop of edges around that face loop, which surrounds that edge. So for example, I can press control R to create a loop around this cylinder. I can scroll up and down to control how many cuts I want to make. And after I click, I can slide this loop cut up and down. I can also right click to make sure it's back in its original place, which is exactly in the middle. Now again, I get a new little menu down here, which is where shit gets crazy. If we increase the number of loop cuts right here, we can also control the factor to kind of shift these loop cuts back and forth. But this is the coolest part. If you increase the smoothness, the loop cuts are essentially going to inflate and you can use that to create a sort of vase shape. What's even crazier is you can control the shape of the inflation. So instead of having an inverse square, you can set it to, for instance, is linear and that's going to give you more of a barrel kind of shape you also have a few more options around here that you can try playing around with next we have the knife tool which is kind of similar to the loop cut but it's used for different things you can activate the knife tool with k so if you press k you can click on one edge then click on another edge and if you hit enter you're going to create a new edge between those two vertices which you just created and the vertices are placed on the two points which you clicked and by the way you can also bevel this and you can also extrude it or apply some of the other tools which we just talked about now in this case we just made a cut up here but we can also make a laser cut straight through this object here's how you do that you press K to activate the knife tool. You can click somewhere outside of the object and then you can click somewhere on the other side of the object. And if you press C, this is going to turn on cut through. So if you now click and you press enter, you're going to get a cut which goes all the way around this object. And again, you can bevel this the same as anything else. You can extrude it and scale it up or scale it down. And so there's a lot of different things you can do with the knife tool. Next, we're going to talk about the spin tool. This is also one of my favorites. So let's say I have this circular plate and I made one screw up here, but I want to copy this screw and I want it to be placed in a circle 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 30 times. I can go to top view. I can select the face in the middle of this object. If I press shift S and cursor to select it, my 3D cursor is going to be placed here in the middle. So now I can go back to the other object. I can select it. I can go to edit mode. And if I select all its geometry in edit mode, I can press Alt E to activate the spin tool. And if I click on spin, it's going to copy the object in a circle around the 3D cursor. Now currently it's just extruded and placed somewhere else. But if I check use duplicates, I'm just going to get copies of the same object on different places. And I currently have 12 steps, but I can control that and I can reduce it or increase it to anything I want. I can also control the angle. So instead of having a full circle, I can just copy them and place them in half a circle, in which case I would probably have to reduce the number of steps. This is also going to work if you have a cross section of something like a pipe. You can spin that around the 3D cursor, but in this case, don't check use duplicates, just increase the number of steps until it looks smooth. And now you're going to extend your cross section into a full circle. This is very convenient for creating joints on pipes, because if we have a cylinder and we go to side view, we can place the 3D cursor next to the top of the cylinder. And if we press Alt E to spin, we can just reduce the angle to something like 90 degrees, and we just have to adjust the steps. And now we have a nice corner for the pipe and we can do the same thing on the other side and maybe make it turn by 180 degrees. Sometimes it's going to get inverted. So you might have to put in minus 180 or minus 90 or something like that. Now the shrink flatten tool is also an interesting one because this lets us select a face or multiple faces and inflate them or push them together. And all of them are going to move in the direction of their individual normal line, but they're going to stay connected. And the normal line of a face is simply the line which points towards the direction towards which the face is facing. In mathematics, a normal line is a line which is perfectly perpendicular to plane. You can see the normal lines for each of these faces right here. And if we extrude something, it's going to move in the direction of its normal line. The same thing is going to happen when we inflate it with Alt S. So let me show you what I'm talking about. If we select this face, 
Then we press Control Shift and we select another face. We're going to select an entire area defined by those two corners. It's a little bit weird when you're doing it on a sphere, but if you do it on a more flat surface, it's a very convenient tool. Now you can press Alt S to activate the Shrink Flatten tool, and now you're gonna be able to push the faces in the direction in which they're facing. It's more useful when you extrude something, you right click it to bring the extrusion back into place. Then you press Alt S, and now it's like you're expanding just a section of this mesh. Did you ever see those diagrams in your old geography books and school where you're looking at like the inside of the earth or the core of the earth and it kind of shows you the different layers well this is basically what you can do with the shrink flatten tool if you shrink one side of a sphere it just pushes it inwards this tool is especially useful if you want to make like a trench which goes all the way around your object for example, we can select these face loops with Alt right click or Shift Alt right click to select both. Then we can press Extrude, right click, and we can use Alt S to push these inwards. You can also make a smaller edge by insetting this entire loop with I, then extruding, right click, and Alt S to push everything inwards. Now you're gonna get a nice trench all the way around this sphere. And the shear tool, although I very rarely use it, it can be useful in some cases. If you click on the shear tool, you're gonna get these weird controls right here. Now, if you select one of the horizontal controls, you're gonna be able to shear this surface along a horizontal axis. You can also select the other one and you're gonna shear it the other way. This is especially useful if you have a surface with some details and you want to make like a slice or you wanna put this at an angle, but you don't just want to rotate it because if you rotate it, it's gonna bend all the geometry around it. So you can use your shear tool to just shear everything or shift it sort of up or down or left or right or whatever way is useful for you. And the rip region tool is another one which is kind of useful, but you can also activate this one with V. So you can select an edge on this cube, and if you press V, you're going to rip that edge off and kind of open up the geometry. Now it can be a little bit clunky to use because it's kind of hard to tell which side it's going to be ripped towards, but you can use this tool to kind of unwrap an object's geometry. The smooth tool I personally never use, but here's what it does. If you have a cube which has been subdivided or loop cut or whatever, you can activate the smooth tool and you can use this yellow button right here to shift it left and right to make this object sort of smoother. In this little menu down here, you can increase the smoothing factor to control how much you want to smooth this. And sometimes this is essentially like beveling some edges. But if we set this to something like one, we can also control the number of repeats we're going to have. And that's going to sort of deflate or collapse this object. If we push this to the extreme, we're gonna get some really weird deformations on the object, which is probably useless, but it's kind of cool. So these are just the most basic modeling tools that you have in edit mode in Blender. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And we're gonna go deep on this in my ebook. So if you want to learn more about modeling tools, modifiers, 3D cursor, proportional editing, all the next level shit that you need to know to really make high quality models, check out the ebook. Let me know what you want to see next. I'll see you guys in the next one.